Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Hello, Fading Memories listeners. Once again, I appreciate you giving us a little bit of your time this week. With me is Dr. Samantha Benjamin Allen. I think I got it right. And she is going to talk to us today about specialized in-home care, why it's important, how we can possibly access it, and all that great stuff. So thanks for joining me, Sam. Thanks for having me, Jennifer. Is Sam okay? Yeah, Sam School. Okay, okay great. <laughs> Thank you um, for what you do um, with this podcast. It's so helpful. I wish I knew about it when my aunt was dealing with Alzheimer's, but I'm still thankful to have discovered it now because it's it's very helpful for me to share with um, patients and families, you know, that I encounter along the way. So thank you for having me. I, I appreciate that. And one of the things that I am most proud of is one is the people listen to all the episodes all the time. I'm actually quite surprised. I discovered that um, only about 20% of the monthly downloads are from the current month's episodes, which is really interesting. And even more important, I am still learning best caregiving practices and new things about research and treatments and all of that stuff three plus years after my mom is gone. So I feel like there's more information and we're getting it out there better than we were before when I started this podcast, which was a little over six years ago. <laughs> most definitely. And it's relevant and it remains relevant, as you can see, because <laughs> most of your downloads aren't happening from the most recent. <laughs> I know. I'm wondering if I should uh, go every other week or something, but then I have so many wonderful people that to talk to. I would just be too busy. So why don't you tell us about you and your background, and then we'll jump into our topic. She seems to be between clients for those who, people who listen, which I appreciate, and don't tune into the YouTube channel. Sam is sitting in her car. <laughs> yes. So I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I am a board-certified physician in physical medicine and rehabilitation, and I offer care in the home um, through consultation to help caregivers navigate the caregiving process and the challenges of our healthcare system, as well as helping their loved ones who may be severely debilitated achieve improved mobility, independence, function, and quality of life, no matter their circumstances. So I could see anybody from stroke, brain injury, spinal cord injury, dementia, um, rehab covers a lot of different issues that impact our function. So I started my practice actually, and this is a new idea <laughs> because I noticed a gap in the system, especially when it came to people who are hospitalized and discharged to home, having this gap in the transition where they might get lost to follow up or we might have made significant and wonderful gains you know, in the inpatient rehab setting, which is the team approach where you have the rehab physician, the therapist, the neuropsychologist, and, you know, anything you can think of the nurses. It's just a very comprehensive process to rehabilitating someone that does not exist in the home setting. And sometimes when they get home, it's like a roadblock and they get lost and they don't get questions answered. They're not getting their needs met. And then they decline and all those gains that they achieved disappear. And I don't want to see that continue to happen. You know, as long as I can help and more word gets out about trying this model where we meet people where they are and come to the home setting to help lead the team and give our recommendations and plans so that they can have success, successful outcomes and don't necessarily have to have a poor quality of life while they're recovering or dealing with a chronic disease. So um, that's the concept of home-based care and having a physician as part of that team who can come to you rather than you have to deal with the frustrations of trying to get to an appointment where you might only get seen for 15 minutes. <laughs> so yeah. I would think having a physician or nurse practitioner, practitioner, easy for me to say, coming into the home versus maybe a doctor or a nurse giving, you know, really detailed instructions to the family member. Like, I'm pretty sure my mom would have been like, no, 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 
you you are the child. You don't know what you're talking about. And she just she would not have had enough respect for me to help continue the rehabilitation that someone like yourself and your team might have gotten started or other caregivers might be nervous, unsure, which is completely understandable. And that that vibe kind of translates. And then the other person, they're not sure and they're a little uncertain and now you just got a mess. So it seems like a really, a much smarter idea than, you know, here's what you need to do. Best of luck. Smack you on the butt on your way out. <laughs> exactly. And there are things that you can see in the home setting that you'll never be attuned to in an office visit. And people tend to be more open as well when you're in the home setting. So you can get a lot of um, information that maybe you would miss at an outpatient visit. Um, so it's beneficial for that. And I think it saves caregivers a lot of costs in the long run. So on average in my area, I work in the DC, Maryland, Virginia metro. Um, so for instance, a skilled nursing facility is an average of $220 $20 a day. And a lot of times people are there for months and they don't make significant gains. And unfortunately, a lot of people decline, um, which is a sad outcome um, to see happen so often. And if you have my model is a concierge base for the home services that I offer. But even if you have that model and you have the plan that you can abide by at home, and even if you have home therapists like occupational physical therapists coming to the home, you can say, I want to follow this plan because there are proven outcomes with this plan. And I might not be getting the results that I want with what I'm getting now. So I'll give you an example. Actually, a AARP uh, put out a study and estimated that caregivers spend about 13 hours a month just doing research on the disease that their loved one is dealing with, managing financial matters, um, you know, planning and trying to navigate appointments and all of these things. So there's cost lost there. You're missing days of work, um, then 13 days out of the month, you're doing ADLs. So that's feeding, dressing, I'm sorry, activities of daily living. I try not to use acronyms, um, but you know, the feeding, the dressing, the toileting and all of these things. And if you can learn strategies to handle these activities that are more efficient and some tricks maybe, especially if you're dealing with someone who has dementia, they can be very stubborn and it makes things very hard to yep. manage and things take a lot longer. <laughs> And you would like them to. Um, so if you you can get some strategies um, to, to help things move a little smoother, um, that can cut a lot of your time and your costs. So there, there are a lot of benefits, I think, to having a home-based care model. And there, there's evidence that having a quote-unquote hospital-based rehab program in a home setting can lead to increased outcomes, 30% you know, difference in cost, meaning you save and the home health that you get with Medicare currently, where they might come out two times a week, maybe see you for 30 minutes, has not proven to show any improve, improvement in functional outcome or mortality. So people aren't functioning better and they're not living any longer because of the system we have in place now. And yet, dollars are being spent. So what's the point? You know, I've seen exactly. people get so frustrated. They only came here for 20 minutes. I only see them once or twice a week and they don't do anything. These are the complaints I hear. <laughs> and sometimes it's hard because if there's no direction, sometimes you might look at somebody and just the severity of their case makes you feel like there's not much to do. But I've worked with people coming out of comas, you know, minimally mm. conscious states and they can make improvements and they can make gains and they can come out better on the other side. But, but there is a method to approaching different issues and diseases that if we work together to try to increase the knowledge and the information out there, just like you're doing, I think we can work together to come to a better solution. Um, I know we're, we're kind of far from this thought process. People were doing house calls, you know, years ago and it's antiquated now, but I think it still has great significance, especially now that our population is aging. And mm -hmm. the U.S. Census Bureau says that by 2034, 65 and older 
people who are indiv- sorry, individuals who are 65 and older will outnumber children. So we're going to be taking care of our loved ones. That's the reality that we're we just gonna have to face. Um, you know, millennial generation. Gen, gen is it twenty thirty four? Sorry. <laughs> yes, twenty thirty four. So okay, sixty five so t- and older population is gonna outnumber the youth. So. So yeah. So my husband. Let's see. He'll be. He'll be. Let's see. Next year he'll be sixty. In 2024. So yeah, he'll be 70 at the end of 2034. And I'll be 68. Eesh. <laughs> yeah. That's, well, you're that's hard to imagine. Jennifer. <laughs> I'll be on the other end. <laughs> you look good. Yeah. Thank but you. these are things we have to think about. Um, our population is aging and it's nice when possible to be able to stay at home. I know in every circumstance, it's not necessarily the best. And if you don't have the support that you need, you know, memory care is appropriate, um, especially when you're dealing with Alzheimer's dementia, because there's the community and there's the team there to help manage your loved one where sometimes they won't let you do anything. <laughs> so, <laughs> that, that was the know. case with my mom. She was very, you know, like, I'm not listening to you. And she was in memory care for three years. And for the Majority of those three years, at least two solid years, she had other friends that they pretty much got into a little bit of mischief, nothing severe. Uh, like they rolled up her area rug and hid it in one of the other Diane's rooms, which I never really did understand, but whatever. You know, it's like there was nothing <laughs> They're harmful. Child in- games. That's, that's I, what happens they, sometimes. <laughs> they loved that rug. I think they were trying to try to protect it or something. I don't know, but I'm like, these two old ladies rolled up this five foot by seven foot area rug and stuffed it in the corner. The other cows were just like, oh, my goodness. But, you know, it's like she would not have had that social interaction and mischief making <laughs> had she lived with me. And I run a business out of my home, so I would have had to have a caregiver. at home. It just, you know, was not. I know a lot of people don't think memory care is ideal, but for her, it was, it was really great, you know, and then, you know, the place, the place was wonderful. They weren't perfect. All of them need more training and more staff, which is more money. And those places are already expensive enough. So <laughs> yes, they are, but you you have to do what works for you. Every mm-hmm. case is not the same and don't throw yourself into a guilt rut about needing to make that decision. If that's, you know, where you stand or what your situation requires. You just want what's best for your loved one at the end of the day. And if that is the most appropriate choice, don't beat yourself over the head about it. Because I know there's a lot of guilt sometimes that goes into having someone in a facility as opposed to home. But you want to make sure at the end of the day, what's right for them is what happens. And it sounds like your mom had a good experience with her, Diane's. Yep. Three of them, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All of all of the Diane's who who were her friends over in the memory care. So yep, yeah, that's fine too. Yeah, I think there was three. There was like thirty residents, and three of them were named Diane, and they all hung out together as if that wasn't confusing enough. But you know, and it was interesting to watch how each one of them progressed. Like you know, my mom's progression was very slow. Other Diane. Um, she got really super paranoid, and then I don't know if her daughters ran out of money. But they moved her out, you know, let's see, I think it was, must have been November of 2019, somewhere around there. It's like hard to remember things pre-pandemic. And then the other, so other, other Diane, when I first met her, I thought she was a visitor. She was dressed nice. Her makeup was great. Her hair was great. She didn't seem any more confused than the rest of the world. (laughs) And for like, I don't know, the first couple of months, I thought she was just a visitor like me. And then one day they were in her room and I was like, wait a minute, this woman lives here? But her her progression was so much faster. I mean, I can't imagine having her at home because, you know, it was just like every day would be a new what the heck is going on kind of day. I mean, we have enough of that as it is. But like with my mom, she was pretty stable for long periods of a time. And this other other Diane, I mean, she literally went from looking like a visitor put together to you know, not having hair combed, not being dressed as nice, not doing her makeup and, and just look, you know, the expression in their face changes so dramatically. So it was really interesting to watch, but you know, when the three of them were together at their peak, whichever, whatever, however you want to call that, 
they had a great time together. And that's what my mom liked to do. She liked to sit around and shoot the breeze. That's good. She had a good experience there. And and that's the funny thing about Alzheimer's dementia. Every course is different for every person. And one minute, you might think you have a handle on things and we got a plan and we got a schedule and we got this person doing meals and this person doing this. And then they might take a turn where the severity increases and it's just like a snap of a finger and you got to revamp the whole thing. And it's, it's really, it's hard to watch. Um, so like my aunt in the last couple months of her dementia, she, she needed to be fed with a syringe. She wouldn't even open mm-hmm. her mouth to eat. She just, she wasn't really doing anything. She, she was completely dependent for everything and um, not even, I know your your mom was mobile for most of her Alzheimer's course, except for after she had a fall. Yep, um, after she broke her leg. <laughs> yeah, and that's, that's usually what takes people down, either an injury or once they get to a point where the feeding, you know, they become dependent for feeding and um, the toileting, you know, the continence goes. Those are more end stage signs of Alzheimer's. Um, but it's still important after an injury to get the appropriate rehab. Immobility is so detrimental. And I know a lot of times because of pain or the complications of the cognitive impairments, people don't get the rehab that they need. And they, you know, develop blood clots or because of venous stasis, meaning the blood isn't circulating because they're immobile, they get um, DVTs or, you know, deep venous thrombosis, pulmonary embolism. Uh, So many things happen. Constipation from the lack of mobility, pressure ulcers because the skin gets weak and breaks down and all these type of complications make the quality of life so much poorer. And even if somebody's at an end stage, we want them to have the best quality possible, you know, and it's nice to be able to help in that regard. And it's good to know that there is help. Um, I Mm -hmm. think sometimes when, when it gets really bad, it looks hopeless. The situation just looks so dire and you might not know there are other options. Or you might wish somebody could come to the house. <laughs> you don't see that as a possibility. Um, so um, that's just something to keep in mind, especially if you are dealing with a loved one who has Alzheimer's and it's more end stage. Please keep them mobilized, even if you're doing passive range of motion exercises and moving their arms and their legs, you know, ranging all of their joints um, is very important. That makes sense. So after mom broke her leg, so I I opted not to have it surgically f- corrected because she needed f- physical therapy with or without the surgery. And I had a physical therapist go to the home that she lived in and she just swatted him away. And I'm wondering now in our conversation, I mean, he was willing to go back a second time, but I'm like, dude, for 150 bucks an hour, I'm not, you know, really willing right. to pay. Is it worth it? I don't know. Yeah. I'm like, I'm not really willing to pay you to be abused again. <laughs> so, right. Um, in, in hindsight, it probably was fine since she did pass away about two and a half weeks after she, she fell off March 8th and died March 31st, however many days that is. Oh, yeah, that, that was um, bad. Yeah. Well, and she was, she'd been urinary incontinent for the most part, and they were starting to have to feed her, not always. Um, Obviously, breaking her leg accelerated all of that. But I'm wondering if, do you think perhaps a somebody more specialized in Alzheimer's and dementia would have been able to, like, maybe persuade her a little bit better? Or is it, you know, just, it was a crapshoot and he did the best he could. I never got to see him because it was right after the shutdown of COVID, so... <laughs> Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about NeuroReserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, 
I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now, fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. Oh yeah, it's hard to say. Um, but there are strategies. You have to you have to be creative in your thought processes when you're dealing with Alzheimer's. Um, but you can persuade people to do the things you know that are good for them, even though they don't believe it. <laughs> um, so uh, sometimes making them think something that you're going to do was their idea is very helpful. Um, or making a game out of it. Games are really helpful when you're dealing with Alzheimer's because you have to imagine that you're dealing with a childlike way of thinking and you have to bring yourself down to a level where you ask yourself, if I was dealing with a child, how could I encourage them to do this thing without making it feel like I am forcing or um, trying to <laughs> abuse them or whatever they might think yeah. you're trying to do? Um, and also explain why, because even with an injury like that, they might not believe their leg's broken. And you're like, yes, you broke your leg, you fell on this day. And if we don't move it, you can get blood clots or this can happen and, and try to tell them maybe the bad things that could happen if you don't do <laughs> what you're what you're trying to do with them and see if it helps. But it's challenging either way you look at it. And for him, it could have been a crapshoot. I don't know. I'd have to be there to see yeah. how he was interacting with her. But um, you, you yeah, do under, have to be creative. Under normal circumstances, I would have met him there. I might have hung out in the hallway. I might have kind of briefed him on my mom in person, um, you know, before he went in. And then if he was having issues, I might have gone in to see if I could help. But, I mean, literally, she fell and broke her leg March 8th. She went back to the care home on the 12th. And on the 16th is when we had the shutdown. So it's like, you know, even even if he had had the ability to be super successful with her, which I never met him and I knew my mom, so I'm not sure success was really in the cards. Just the whole COVID thing was like, that just threw a whole pile of wrenches into yes. the works. That, that was hard. Yeah. yeah. So, it, so, you know, I I was actually quite, okay with her being wheelchair bound because she liked to watch her feet while she walked and she would walk, you know, 10, 15 feet behind me. I've learned from a past guest that it was probably because she was the oldest of four. So she liked to keep an eye on the children, the younger siblings. Um, and you couldn't, you couldn't persuade her, sweet talk her, threaten her. You could not get her to walk arm in arm with you. Cause I know she didn't have good peripheral vision and so walking yeah, next you to you was to fall or anything. Oh, yeah. She never fell on my watch, thank goodness. But I could just imagine, and I've said this a zillion times, I probably sound like I have Alzheimer's at this point. But I was so afraid that she was gonna face plant on the sidewalk and you know, passers by were gonna like beat me up because I was such a horrible person. I mean, it was just oh, boy. you know, because if I slowed down, she would slow down. If I'd stop, she'd stop. I mean, it was like Oh my God. It was so Exhausting. frustrating. Yeah. And, and all I was trying to do is make sure she didn't trip over her feet or trip over the crack in the sidewalk. You know, I mean, we've all done that. You, know, you trip over your own feet and you're like, you're like, most of us can catch our balance, but sometimes, you know, those feet, they get in the way. Yeah. Sometimes we go down and even that can make a game, you know, riding, riding in the, I don't know what you want to call it, amusement park ride or something. Yeah. <laughs> See if you can get them to um, sit for a long walk. Of course, you still want them to try to mobilize as much as possible in a safer space. And if you feel like where you're walking outside might be a little dangerous um, or long distance in the community, you can use a chair. But it really, it really depends on what you're dealing with. Some people have balance issues. Some people don't. It's more, you know, mobility-wise, they're great. 
But the other things are the challenge, the aggression, the paranoia, the wandering, getting lost, you know, on multiple occasions and all of those things. Um, so it's challenging either way you look at it, you know, you just have mm-hmm. to do your best, do your best to take time out for yourself. Because as caregivers, a lot of times we end up neglecting ourselves, not thinking about our needs, and then we get burned out. Yep. And also try not to worry about what it looks like to other people because sometimes it just doesn't make sense. You have to do weird things to survive <laughs> <laughs> when you're dealing with a loved one who has Alzheimer's. And it might look weird to somebody in the public, or like you said, they might think that looks abusive, but yeah. As long as you're not truly abusing them and you have to, you might have to use some um, manipulating the circumstance to, to fit a doable outcome or solution that you're trying to get to. Just do what you got to do. Don't worry about what people are saying, what they're thinking. Um, just what works for you. If you find something that works, just, just do it and don't worry about what people are going to say or think. You know, all the time we come across people sometimes and don't know what they're dealing with or if they have um, some type of cognitive impairment or um, mental retardation or things like that. And people are quick to judge. But I think there's an added sensitivity when you're a caregiver to be sensitive to those type of things and interact with people regardless of what it looks like. And if you see someone struggling, ask if they need some help. Um, And like you said in your podcast, and what I also encourage with the caregivers I talk to, make a list of things that you need help with so that you can get a little load off and focus on the things maybe that you excel in a little better. Like if you know your loved one will never let you take, you know, give them a bath or something, give it to somebody else. And use mm-hmm. use wipes. Use wipes sometimes. You know, a good bath will get the nooks and crannies. The wipes don't cut it <laughs> after a while. But you don't have to do a bath every day. Um, you can maybe a niece or a nephew that they're more willing to sit with and let them give them a bath. Let them do that. Um, and the there's no shame anymore. You really got to let go of that. Um, sometimes it's pride and sometimes it's, a dignity thing. But if you're not comfortable doing a certain thing, don't be afraid to ask somebody you trust if they're willing to take it on. Because you can really take off some of the burden from yourself because it it can be very tiring. And I I saw my cousin, I mean, I was a a once removed, I guess, from the process because I wasn't living in the house. But I, I, I noticed my cousin struggle a lot, even, you know, just getting to appointments or just to turn my aunt and get her in a good position because she literally put all her weight on you at one point. There was no initiation or no no assistance in any type of movement. It was just all her weight on you. <laughs> so it's it was it was challenging. And to imagine getting to an appointment just to try to get her in a chair and and carry her down the steps on your back. I mean it was just it was a lot. <laughs> so. Yeah we have we do not have a physical infrastructure in probably 99% of our communities that are good for aging in place. My husband's a real estate broker and it just baffles me. Like single story homes are very, very popular. So developers do about 25% of their developments are single story and 75% of them are two story. And a lot of them, maybe 25 townhomes. (laughs) Yeah. And maybe 25% of the two story might have the primary bedroom on the main floor. So, you know, maybe you got 50% of your housing stock that is possible for aging in place. But one of the things that I say all the time, and I actually convinced my husband of this before we moved to where we are now, is that, you know, when you get to 85 years old, why in the hell do you want to take care of a home? You know, there's the maintenance, there's, you know, there's laundry, there's mopping and, you know, cleaning and cooking and what? Yeah. It's too much. It's too much. You know, and it, it's like if you, and I wish we had a lot more options for independent senior living and assisted living because, you know, like I don't want to move into an apartment inside a building because I've always had dogs. I have golden retriever. So 
<laughs> oh, nice. You on your own space, yeah. Yeah, so if I had, you know, but a little cottage with a little garden patio where you could sit out in the nice weather that we finally have in California now and, you know, enjoy your morning tea or coffee or, you know, we have a tendency now that it's nice enough, we eat all our meals out on the deck. It's beautiful. And, but we only need the deck space. Like I got somebody that takes care of the yard and I like don't go in the yard because it's basically just a view. So it's just silly. But um, I was going to ask, because we're kind of like typical of me, we get a little sideways on the topic. So people, they like subscribe to your service. I'm not sure what the right terminology is. Is it like an annual membership? Yeah, it's like membership? membership, annual membership. So okay. patients would, or clients, because really it's the caregiver driving the process, but they either pay for a six month membership or a year, a year membership. And I'll come up to 10 times a year and my visits are much more extensive than you would get in an outpatient setting. So we'll go through the whole history, you know, medication review, make sure there's nothing you're taking that's actually adding to decline or making you deteriorate faster. Because sometimes the side effects of medications that people are placed on actually potentiate the dementia. Um, And people aren't really paying attention to that. So you have to, you know, be mindful of that. And also we come up with a partnered plan. So I give them the recommendation and treatment plan to help them achieve optimal outcomes. And if they already have home therapists coming in, they can choose to follow that if they don't feel like they're making any gains or progress with their current regimen, or we can just start a new plan from scratch, depending on what the situation is. But yes, it's a membership-based model. And I've just chosen to go that route because I found it difficult dealing with insurance companies. Um, And to survive as a physician these days, the volume of people you have to see to account for the denials that they give you (laughs) and the, you know, they... They don't authorize things that you want to do to help people. It's just very frustrating. And it just makes it much easier this way to get headway. There are a lot of roadblocks um, when you're dealing with insurance companies in a lot of situations now. Don't get me wrong. It's still important, especially if you're in a hospitalized situation to have it. But um, that was what I was going to ask. So we pay for your annual membership. Then we also should have must have maybe is the right word like a hospitalization plan like what other right. coverage so you would, do you would still want to have your insurance for potential issues if you were hospitalized um that bill would be very large you don't want to no. take that on um and it will cover your prescriptions so most people have their primaries prescribing a lot of their medications but in the rehab world if there's anything that I think you could benefit from even equipment um, like, you know, grab bars, toilet seats, um, walker, cane, whatever, DME that might be appropriate for you. I can prescribe that. Your insurance would cover those things um, or rehab related prescriptions. Sometimes there are people who have something called spasticity, which is basically increased muscle tone or stiffness, for instance, after a stroke or a brain injury that really affects their mobility in a limb and their Um, use of it. And we could do those injections or, um, I'm sorry, Botox injections is what they're called. It's not for cosmetics like most of the people know it for. Um, We use it to help with spasticity. And uh, also like joint injections, if you have severe arthritic pain that's really limiting you, we could do something like that. So those, those are along the lines of things that I could offer, but the insurance would cover basically the prescription part of it, or if you need to be hospitalized, or even if you had home health care, um, they would cover that, but I would help to direct that care team. So it's basically transposing the rehab experience from the hospital to the home where you have a team approach, because without that team approach, as I told you, the outcomes have not been any better. The mortality rates have not been any better. So we're, we're missing something. There's a gap there. Well, just being in a hospital setting is not necessarily good for 
older adults or any of us really. My husband was in the hospital for five days with no natural light. I mean, no, no quiet. It wasn't, they weren't rooms. It was awful. It really looked like a third world country. I was not happy. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> and it's definitely not good for people with Alzheimer's <laughs> because no, this makes the- them more confused and aggressive a lot of times. And it's unfamiliar. And we, we know that being in a familiar environment is, is better when you're dealing with dementia. Um, so I think I'm, I'm going to add a little more information because I don't think some people know what inpatient rehab is. So hospital rehab isn't like when you're hospitalized in ICU or a uh, cardiac tele, you know, medicine unit. It's really, it's a really fun spin on the hospital. It's different. <laughs> so it's a team of providers specialized and skilled in, you know, physical occupational speech therapies, neuropsychologists to deal with any cognitive or emotional um, impacts that your situation has caused. Um, the rehab physician directing the team on the best approach to help you get the best result and the nurses, and then the ancillary staff. So it's recreational therapists. So there's games. It's a really comprehensive process in your recovery because it's a holistic approach to dealing with people. And I think that's the best way to achieve better outcomes is dealing with the whole person, you know, mental, emotional, physical, spiritual, all of these things impact our health. And we have to do a better job of addressing people in a holistic way. And unfortunately, our system doesn't really allow the time to do that, to be honest, because it does take time Mm -hmm. to give quality. And um, that's one of the major challenges um, that I think we, we need to figure out a better way to go about managing patients while giving them the time they deserve to get the outcome that we desire. At the end of the day, most of us went into healthcare to help people. Yeah. And it's hard for us to, to do that with the constraints that the framework of our system places. It really is challenging. So um, I think gradually we'll get there if we keep putting the word out and <laughs> People like you, you know, keep (laughs) doing good and being a force to to make some impact to help people out along their journey and and support people, you know, no matter what phase of life, especially with Alzheimer's that they're dealing with. Um, So I guess one day at a time. I I see it changing. I've talked to a pharmacist who is um, his biggest goal is to train physicians on how you can continue to earn money while de-prescribing medications. That's what got my attention oh, on Instagram. Nice. Yeah. Uh-huh. You think I could remember the name of it's geriatrics is the name of his business. Okay. Um, I've also got an, an episode. It's coming out about the same time as this one, probably before this one that um, getting more from your uh, prescription copay. So it's a company mm-hmm. that basically puts your prescription medications, they're on a roll in individual um, little bubble packs, I guess you could call it. And so mm-hmm. your AM medicine comes out. And then if you have a lunchtime medicine and they give you a 30 day supply. So if you're in the hospital and they say, remove this and add this, they will send you X number of pills to get you to the next start of the month. And as long as you've got five or more prescriptions, mm-hmm. it doesn't cost you anything. And they've got text messaging, emailing, people that call you. So there's people to talk to if you're confused. Like my dad came out of the hospital. He was on 26 medications. It was delete these, add these, change these. And my husband and my sister and I, my sister's got an MBA. And it was like, yeah, all these pills are white. You know, It's too much. Oh, my God. (laughs) And it was terrifying because it was like, we don't want to poison him or kill him by not doing it right. It was it was. You know, and I think because all the so many of the pills were all the same, they were all like white and brown. It was like it was like I I think we were Googling them. It was like, this is a nightmare. So I am seeing a change. And hopefully, you know, I'm 56, so maybe it'll change quick enough that I can, you know, 
take take advantage of some of this. But so if I'm a caregiver or, you know, I get to 65, which holy crap is only nine years, nine and a half, actually. <laughs> Dear God. <laughs> um, You're going to be all right. Yeah, I'm I plan on living to 103 like my paternal grandmother. So you guys are all stuck with me. Nice. So you have to go on Medicare. I've learned that from another recent episode. And because if you don't and you wait like a year, then you're penalized forever for not going on Medicare at 65. So yikes. So wow. how would so I would I would subscribe, you know, pay for you for concierge medicine. And then would I need like just like basic Medicare or that's probably something you'd have to talk to a Medicare specialist about, but yes, you... I'm, I don't think I'm going to answer that correctly. <laughs> so okay. I won't answer that. A Medicare specialist would be best because there are okay. a lot of intricacies. They have like sub plans and subsidiary. There's all these little nuances. There's of, yeah. There's so. a lot. I didn't know about the, um, <laughs> the penalty, you know, because some people don't necessarily want to retire at 65 and they might have a good, healthcare plan through their job, but if they don't switch, then they're permanently penalized. That was, that was a first for me. I did not know yeah, that. I've seen people who still work um, supplement. So they still have the Medicare to fulfill the requirement, um, but they, they maintain their coverage with their employer and they, they just use it for what they choose to. Um, maybe the prescription plan would allow them to have cheaper costs with medications if they use the Medicare and then they use the supplement for, for other things. So you kind of have to do your research on which plan's best for you because Medicare does have multiple um, affiliations with other insurances. Um, so there are a lot of plans available. So I don't know if I answer that. It's going to be accurate depending on <laughs> which one you pick. Um, and I don't the short know all answer the is ins and outs. The short answer is just call a Medicare specialist because it is way more research headache than we all want to deal with. And that's what they're there for. You might as well take advantage of it because it's going to save you time and money in the long run. Do you see more? Let me back up one step. So in late 2019, early 2020, I was actually looking for a concierge doctor for my mom because mm -hmm. getting her to doctor's appointments and that kind of stuff. I mean, until she broke her leg, she could physically get there, but she wasn't super willing <laughs> and right. she wasn't always cooperative. And I just thought, actually, I was told by a friend that was is also a volunteer for the Alzheimer's Association. Um, I was probably bellyaching about something. And she's like, you need to find a concierge doctor for your mom. And I'm like, that is such a thing. I thought that was just a TV show. Uh, what was that called? Royal Pains. I love that show. <laughs> I haven't and seen that one. Oh, I don't know if it's been off the air for a while, but if you can find it in streaming or reruns or whatever, whatever those options are these days. And he was a concierge doctor in, um, I don't know, the fancy part, fancy beach towns on your side of the country. Like Virginia God. Beach or? No, up higher, the rich parts. What was the name? You're going to say oh, it. And I'm gonna... um, the beaches in New York. Um... Or like Maryland. Oh, geez. Maybe it'll come to me. But I'm when I went looking, the only concierge doctors that were available, like yourself, where it was like a yearly membership, were only available like in San Francisco, Oakland. And we were in mm -hmm. the suburbs. And the people mm -hmm. that were servicing the suburbs wanted like $1,500 of visit. And I was like, no, thank you. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's a lot. Mom's got some money, but I'm not spending it like that. You know, I might have changed my mind if I'd known what was coming, but, you know, it wouldn't have, I don't think it would have helped. But uh -huh. do you see more physicians like yourself choosing this path? So maybe, you know, in five years time, we might actually have more suburban concierge doctor options. I think I said yes, that right. I do, I do see more physicians choosing this model to serve, um, especially in their communities where there are people in a situation where it's difficult to get to an office. So I think in the coming years, we're going to see more options for concierge medicine. And wherever you are, look, Google search it and see what's available. Because um, there are physicians doing concierge medicine um, now for some of the same reasons that I mentioned I'm doing it. Um, so there are options. I, I want you guys to know that you're not alone. And there there are options that are outside the box to help meet your needs. And there are people who are trying to fill in that gap. 
So just seek us out and we're here to help. <laughs> <laughs> and it's from what I know about the challenges of getting like, I know caregivers whose family members are end of, you know, they're at the end stage of Alzheimer's, they're bed bound, you know, they have to be fed and changed and everything like you mentioned. And they don't have an option. Like they can't get their person out the door. There's stairs and they, so they can't use a wheelchair. And, you know, it's like I said, our, our city infrastructure is not designed for people who aren't mobile, which is astonishing, but it's the fact so, you know, what do you do when, you know, maybe they've got like this one gal, her mom keeps spiking fe- like really low grade fevers at night. And I, I suggested that maybe it's just because the brain is having a difficult time keeping the body temperature regulated because it happens in the evening. I'm like, I don't know. I'm just taking a wild guess here, but I've talked to enough people that this sounds logical, but it's like, you know, you can't just take mom to the doctor. And yeah, you, know, and you really wouldn't want to take it. Her- to a hospital that's the last place you want to go in that type of situation and unfortunately that's like the last result when people are in a situation like that it's like let's just call 911 (laughs) and then the the hospital is really all the poking and the prodding and just for them to say well there's not really anything we can do let's give them some iv fluids maybe it's a little uti you can get a a test at home Mm -hmm. and get treated for uti a lot of times that's what it is it's um, a urinary tract infection because it, it causes confusion and it can cause some fevers and um, you might just simply need some fluids and antibiotic. And if you have skilled nursing already coming there, you can have a physician there to pre- prescribe some IV fluids that you can actually get at home, especially if it's somebody who's not taking anything by mouth rather than going through the whole ordeal of a hospitalization, where sometimes you end up leaving worse off or <laughs> not getting out at all which is not what we want. <laughs> no. So, yeah. Well, this has been really fascinating. It's just, I've been doing this show for a little over six years and it's amazing the changes that I'm seeing from, you know, my little office here in the Sierra foothills in Northern California. It's like, like I said, you know, I've, I'm seeing more options for helping, you know, age in place, which is what everybody says they want to do. And, caring for somebody, you know, cause not everybody's got the option to put somebody in a care home like I did, or that might not be the, even if they've got the money that might, might, might not be what they want to do. Um, you know, my mom swore up and down. That's not what she wanted. <laughs> it was not fun to move her there, but once she got acclimated, it was okay. But you know, it's just, we just need more support and I'm a big proponent of, I think when somebody's diagnosed with any form of dementia, they should just immediately be enrolled in palliative care because I feel like that would save everybody time and money and stress. But, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't have the magic wand to make that happen with our system yet. Hopefully I talk about it enough. Somebody somewhere might hear it, you know, and then options like you for the concierge medicine. Yeah. There's so because many things you, you can't. There's so many things you, you really could do at home under a palliative model because when you get to a hospital they're just running tests and they're just doing all these things and at the end of the day you're asking yourself but I don't really want to do any interventions at this stage right and then you got people getting mad like why'd you come here then yeah. <laughs> it's a mess it's a, it's a mess and I, I think we can do a better job of managing people where they are of course in some circumstances you know emergency more um intervention might be necessary but a lot of times that's that's not the direction to go in and there are more conservative ways to address an issue than going through the ordeal of a hospitalization uh so i i think i think we can we can get there um and we're all learning we're, yeah. we're, we're just we're learning and evolving as we go and changing processes and coming up with new models to get the goals that we're trying to achieve here. Um, we got, we got a ways to go, but I think things are, things are coming along. Things are changing. So. Well, that's, that's a good thing. It's obviously we need to, we need the changes to come from the ground up. Cause our government's not going to, I mean, it's, 
I don't know how you basically say, we have this for-profit system and now we're going to this other system. I mean, even if it, even if going to complete like a Medicare fall, like a lot of people have talked about, even if that was a thousand percent better than what we have now, just the change would be so painful. <laughs> so we yeah, need people like you to. Is painful. Yeah, it's hard. It's scary. Like I'm kind of for that system, but then, you know, my logical brain kicks in and goes, but what about this? And what about that? And well, ew, uh, you know, and it's like, eh, I don't know. I just try to stay healthy so I don't have to deal with any of it. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's hard to please everybody when, when you're trying to change a model. So, yes, that's true. Well, I really appreciate what we have. <laughs> yeah, I really appreciate this. I know you're between clients, so I don't want to keep you any longer, which my listeners know I'm really good at doing. <laughs> Plus, I have to go pick up my car from service. <laughs> this is awesome. Well, so you guys all need to, if you're not in the D.C., Maryland area, um, Google Concierge Doctors and... It was a, it was like that show Royal Pains. It wasn't Martha's Vineyard, but it was one of those like then that fancy place people go to from the city in the summer. The Hamptons? Right. I don't know. Yes, that's it. The Hamptons. Thank you. I knew you would figure it out. <laughs> there we go. We got we it. We don't have such a thing in in California that I'm aware of cuz the whole coast is beach, but yes, so that's that's what he did. He was a concierge doctor in the Hamptons and uh Royal Pains was a great show. It's a good model, but we need we need it to not just be for rich people. So we do have a long way to go. And I really appreciate that you're one of the people leading the change. Thank you. You, you have, have a, a terrific great evening. You too. Thank you so much. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.